Hello, good evening, and um, welcome to everyone who has joined us today for how we got here. Um, this session will be delivered by myself, um, Josh Gary. They still have Joshua Gary on here, and my mother calls me that. Um, but yeah, I, I just really want to thank you all for, for coming. You've been really, really consistent, and it really, really fills my heart that so many people um, take out their personal time to join these sessions and learn more about um, British history. So thank you very much. Um, a course outline. So what we did, we, we looked at the presence of Africans in Britain. That was the first place we started. And we looked at Cheddar or, or Black people. We started with Cheddar Man. We progressed from Cheddar Man to look at um, the Afro-Romans. Um, and then we looked at the Black Tudors. And we kind of discussed why, for example, there may have not been, or why there was not such a um, large presence um, of Black people during the Middle East, Medieval Ages. We then looked at the construction of race. And the understanding that, you know, race or racism as we, we know it today as a starting point. Um, and, you know, I was speaking to my mentor about those sessions. And I think one thing he was quite, quite key. One thing he really wanted me to stress was, you know, the difference between acts of racism and institutional racism. But hopefully um, in doing this, we're going to start to challenge some of these issues that are in our society. Um, and now we're going to start to look at the contribution of black people to Britain. So this week and next week, we're going to look at how black people have contributed to Britain. And then the final session, we'll look at why there's a special relationship between the United Kingdom and US in terms of race, um, in terms of identity, in terms of politics, and in terms of rights. So let's be what we, what we learned about last week. So we were learning mainly about the, the different forms of resistance that took place during the transatlantic slave trade. And we also looked at the legacy of the transatlantic slave trade. Um, to my right and left, we have Yar Sante from um, the Ashanti Kingdom, which is you know, modern day Ghana. And you have Queen Nzinga, who was from um, the, Congo, the Congo Kingdom, which was, um, you know, which is situated near modern day Angola. And, what was really key and what a lot of people were hopefully able to see from last week's session was that the fight against the transatlantic slave trade, slave trade started from the very beginning. It didn't end, you know, Africans, enslaved Africans, whether it be in Africa itself, whether it be in the Americas, or whether it be in Britain, were constantly fighting against the transatlantic slave trade. To my bottom left, you have George Hibbert, um, founder of the Hibbert family, and you know, in his story, we were able to see how the transatlantic slave trade transformed the lives of some people in Britain. And in actual fact, it, it, it led to, or it meant that people like George Hibbert, who were once merchant cloth traders from, from Manchester, I mean, you know, they traded in cloth, were eventually able to buy themselves a place in the aristocracy. They were able to become judges. Cut the story short, they made an extreme amount of wealth from the transatlantic slave trade in cities like Bristol, Liverpool, London, East India Docks, the city of London, and how the transatlantic slave trade was central um, to the emergence or the growth of these different areas. And to the bottom right, we have um, Steve Beacock from South Africa, who, you know, unfortunately, we didn't really get to appreciate the, the greatness of this guy's ideas because he was tragically taken from us. But what he brought to our attention was the role of history in the lives of black people and why it's important because you know if in his in his words if black people can't trace their history then they always feel like pretenders they always feel like imposters they feel like nobodies because they're confronted with magnificent examples of history and they don't have any history that they can claim for themselves but also he brings to our attention the, the amazing role of white people and all people in in helping to push this fight forward. I think he describes white people as the lubrication inside the car engine that allows the gears to shift, meaning that we all have a point, we all have a place or a part to play in this fight. In today's lesson then, session five, we're gonna be looking at how black people contributed to Britain. And we're gonna be looking at two key periods for this session. We're gonna be looking at the Georgians and we're also gonna be looking at the Victorians. Now, when we talk about, or when we mention the Black Jordans, we're pretty much talking about the Black people who lived during the time of King George. Now, there are various King Georges, and, you know, they range from 1714 to 
1830. And, you know, as I said, this was a period, um, you know, during the 18th and 19th century where the idea of a nation, the idea of Great Britain started to, started to develop. And there was so much change that was taking place during that time. And then we'll also be talking about Queen Victoria, arguably the, the most famous monarch in British history. And one of the key or one of the most significant parts of um, Queen Victoria is that she was queen at the peak of what we call the British Empire. Um, that's basically when Britain owned 25% of the world. And it explains why. Um, you have a number of people like myself, you have people from Asia, I have so many different people in Britain today. Now, um, challenge to the empire. In this session, I would like to shine a light on the lives and achievements of some black people who lived in Britain between 1830 and 1900. They were active in our politics. They contributed to politics, they contributed to medicine, law, business, the theater, music, sports, journalism, and local theater. The argument that I've said black British history is British history should be strengthened when we go through this session. We should be able to find more and more how black people have been able to contribute and how black people were almost present at you know, most of the key significant moments that took place um, in British history. Now, the first group we're going to look at, the first group we're going to look at will be the Georgians. Now, with the Jordans, it's very, very important for us to, to understand what was happening in the world at this point. During the 1700s up until 1840, slavery was still rampant, slavery was still happening. And so with the Black Jordans, you're going to find a number of people who were able, a number of Black people, should I say, who were able to achieve miraculous, um, miraculous achievements in, in the face of racism. But that story quite often is tied in with the transatlantic slave trade. If we move to the Victorians, there will be a bit more of a distance. Now, by the early 18th century, Africans lived and worked in towns all over the country. Um, and, you know, there was approximately about 20,000 African people who lived here at that time. And you could find Africans in you know, many different jobs. You had Africans who worked in the Navy, you had Africans who worked in the military, you had Africans who worked in factories. Here you have um, the picture of somebody called William Ansa, a prince from what is now Ghana. And this story is quite significant because what you often had, and it's quite controversial, but quite often the wealthy people from West Africa, wherever in Africa, would often send their children over to the United Kingdom to be educated. And, this man here, William Anza, he's, a, he's an example of someone who was sent over to be educated. Okay, now, as I said, most black people from Georgian Britain experienced common forms or, or common challenges such as racism. In these individual stories, we will encounter remarkable tales of responses to adversity, but also a picture of Britain from 1700 to 1900 hopefully that's what i'm going to try not to do okay i'm i'm, I'm looking at the the comments because um I've, I've learned that sometimes people don't quite understand what i'm saying so i'll try and bear these comments in mind whoever's got their mics on please turn them off so everyone can listen okay so we have francis barber who we came across during the first session, but I want to tell us a bit more about Francis Barber. Now, Francis Barber was brought to Britain from Jamaica as a slave when he was 15 years old, but he was set free when his, older, when his owner died. And he was a servant and friend to a famous writer known as Dr. Samuel Johnson. Now, in Francis Barber's life, he was able to open his own school in Litchfield, which is um, an area not too far away from Minster. Um, he was known as a great swordsman, and musician. And I think what I find interesting about Francis Barber's story is one, you know, that, that struggle of somebody who came to Britain as, as a young boy who was enslaved, who was able to fight against it. And not only was he able to fight against it and, you know, um, gain freedom for himself, he was able to actually, you know, rise and do well in Britain, which is a story I found quite interesting. Now, in this picture, you have um, one of Francis Barber's great, 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 great grandchildren, um, Cedric Barber. 
Um, and some of us were here for the first session, but for those who weren't here during the first session, who do you think um, is Francis Barber's um, grandchild? If just, you know, quickly put your comments inside the chat, let me see who was Francis Barber's great grandchild. Hey, thank you, Maya. I can see we've been remembering. So yeah, Cedric Barber is on the right. Cedric Barber is the, is the white person on the right. And it's, it's really, really an interesting story when looking at um, the Black Jordans. There was often a time that happened to all the Black Jordans. They suddenly vanished because there was such a large population of them. And Cedric Barber says, you know, they've been hiding in the skies. Now, I'm going to do a bit of a risk. There's a video that I've got that's taken from um, David Oloshoga's um, Black and British, um, the, you know, the story. And it kind of allows Cedric Barber to tell a little bit about his story. And I'd love to play it for us to have a look. If it doesn't work, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll check the chat and I, I won't try it again. But it would be great to, to give it a go. So let's go here. Share. No, so that's not the one I want to play. So bear with me. I'm, I'm more comfortable with you guys now. So I know you, you will bear with me and allow me to. Um, to show you some of the important information. But yeah, whilst we're waiting for it to download, I'll, I'll just quickly say um, it's quite interesting because quite often you'll find that there are many people who might have descendants who are of African origin, who are of Caribbean origin, who are living amongst us today who we don't know because or who may not know about their origins because of the complexity of their skin, which is, you know, something I think is, you know, rather interesting. I did download it before. Um, what I will do is I'm going to continue with the session. And when the video downloads, I will share it with you or I'll, or I'll put a link in the chat either way. Okay, so where were we? Now, moving on. You have a really, really interesting story. And I, I, I love this story. And this is about somebody called Ignatius Sancho. Now, and, and I, I love the name Ignatius. My, you know, one of my best friends is called Jordan Ignatius. I, I always thought that was quite interesting. But Ignatius Sancho was born in a slave ship in 1722. Um, but he was brought to England at the age of 20. And as I've already pointed out, with, with the Black Jordans, quite a lot of them came from um, or were, were children of slave and who managed to you know, escape or, or free themselves. And that's a very interesting story you're going to find with Ignatius Sancho. Now, he actually, Ignatius Sancho actually ran away um, from his slave master. And when the slave master asked him to return, you know, he refused and he was able to find, um, you know, safety. And in this time, he, you know, he was able to teach himself how to read, how to write. He later wrote two plays and several musical compositions. And um, he was also married to a black woman from the Caribbean. And they opened a grocery shop in Westminster. I don't, I don't know how significant, you know, that is, but I think what was quite interesting at the time, because of how the transatlantic slave trade impacted Af Africa in terms of the gender ratio, you had, you know, the majority of men um, were enslaved. And that meant that a lot of the African men who came over to Britain at the time weren't able to find indigenous women or women from their, region, from their country. Um, but Ignatius Sancho is quite interesting because, you know, he was able to do that. Now, what I find truly remarkable about Sancho's story, and I think it's amazing, is that he, it reveals how the Black Georgians adapted and he starts to touch on ideas that we still talk about today. Ideas about identity, ideas about race, ideas about belonging. Um, and there was a time he wrote this. He said, I am only a lodger and hard on that. And it's quite interesting that, you know, the black people or the black Jordans at that time didn't necessarily feel connected um, in, in, in British society. And Ignatius Sancho, he's a really, really interesting character because um, he, he quite often used, you know, quite a lot of humor and sarcasm in, in, his, in his compositions and in, in his writing. Now, this is something I also found, find interesting. Um, he signed letters to the press as Africanus, um, he referred to other Africans as my brother Negroes, and he described himself as only a thick-lipped son of Afrique. Now, these statements might reveal several things, but they also pose further questions. 
Did the black community in Britain have a sense of pride for the African heritage? Did they respond to racism by taking ownership over racial terms and stereotypes? Now, for me, I think the way he is so, but I think by referring to himself as Africanus, you already get that sense that Ignatius Sancho was proud of his African heritage, you know, and he, where he says, only a fit lit son of Afrique. Now, this is quite interesting because, you know, I'm talking about someone who was living in the 1700s. And what you had in the you know, 1960s, 1970s, you had um, a movement in America or in the United States of America known as Black Power. Now, I don't want to get into all the, the ins and outs about Black Power, but one of the things, one of the key successes I would say with Black Power was the appreciation and love for, you know, African themes or just African history. And one of, you know, the key symbols of the Black Power movement was the Afro, you know, the Afro. And that was, you know, them showing that, you know, Black is beautiful. And I find that interesting because even if you flip back to 1700s, it appears to me that Ignatius Sancho might have been doing the same thing when he said, only a thick lipped son of Afrique. And my fiance would probably laugh at this, but she's a massive fan of Beyonce. And in one of um, Beyonce's song, she says, you know, I love my men with Michael Jackson nostrils. And once again, that is, you know, us appealing to the idea that black is beautiful. And for so long, um, Western mainstream media has given us a certain image of what it means to be beautiful, whether it be, you know, hair, skin complexion, and features. And I think what I'm trying to say with Ignatius Sancho is I'm quite, I'm quite taken aback by how proud he was of not only his African heritage, but his African features. And I think he found a real sense of beauty in them. But also, one of the other interesting terms I found about Ignatius Sancho is when he refers to other Africans as my brother Negroes. Now, this might not be too dissimilar about how the US hip hop community took ownership of a rather troublesome term. And for those who aren't aware of the troublesome term I'm referring to, it's the, it's the term of the N-word. Um, but in a similar way to, like I said, how the hip hop community has have taken ownership of it and flipped it and made it kind of a badge of honor, I can see Ignatius Sancho doing a very, very similar thing in the 1700s. And I, I just thought that, you know, that was, that was cool. That was truly remarkable. Um, which, yeah, which is really, really good. So I spoke a bit about Ignatius Sancho. I've got a composition for Ignatius Sancho, which I can play, which has been downloaded, and I would like to share with you. So if I, and if it doesn't, I will, if this does not work, I will not do it again. Okay, so this is the Francis Papa piece. Let's see. Okay, share computer sound. So, Hopefully this should work. If it doesn't, I'll find out. Francis had a son called Isaac. Francis had a son called Isaac. Isaac had a son called Enoch. Enoch had a son called Edward. Edward had a son called Norman. And Norman had a son called Cedric. And that's me. And it's as direct as that. That's my family tree on my father's side going back 250 years. Historians sometimes say that there's a mystery about the disappearance of the black Georgian population, that we know numbered thousands. Mm. But really, the answer to that mystery is you. Yes. We're going around in disguise, in camouflage, walking about the place, and many people don't know. But I'm glad that I know. I'm proud of that, because they're mine, and because it's my history, and I feel sorry for people okay. who don't know. So what I'm going to do is I want to quickly check the um, group chat to see if you were able to hear that. So let me just check the chat. Were we able to hear? Were we able to hear that? Great. So they said that was great. Brilliant. Okay. And the final piece that I'm going to share with you before um, I continue is the violin extract from Ignatius Sancho. Um, and this is 
quite a cool one. So let me just find it. Don't worry, what we'll do is we'll do the same thing we did last time where um, we will wait to, we'll wait for it to download. I did download it, but for some reason it didn't work. So I'll wait for it to download and then we will continue ahead. Anyway, so that was a little bit about um, Ignatius Sancho and um, Francis Barber. Felix Wheatley, another very, very important person. And with Felix Wheatley, I think the reason why her story is so important was, um, you know, the transatlantic slave trade robbed Africa of many things. Um, but one of the most important acts of theft was against the voice of women. When we do hear about the transatlantic slave trade, we often, if we hear about it, we hear about it through the voice of men. We hear about it through the voice of men such as Alina Criano and um, Otuba Kogano. Okay, but Felix Wheatley, Felix Wheatley's story is quite important because she's probably one of the first black people who provide us with writing um, and you know, kind of bring to our attention the horrors of the transatlantic slave trade. Um, and as I said, the, the thing about the, the Black Jordans is quite a lot of them existed in the backdrop of the transatlantic slave trade. So that clearly dominated um, a lot of their lives or their work. But with Felix Wheatley, you know, she published poems on various, um, various subjects. And in a similar way to um, Ignatia Sancho, she was quite proud of her African heritage and she, you know, she identified herself in one of her poems as, you know, a young African painter. And um, what Felix Wheatley kind of had to do, uh, and I find it quite interesting and you can look at it in terms of, you know, whether you, you're a musician now, she had to appeal to the tastes of her audience. So a number of her poems, or a number of her compositions kind of, you know, give them what they want, whether we talk about Christianity or something like that. However, Wheatley also showed a huge amount of black consciousness for someone at that period. And I don't know, maybe, maybe you can look at this as an act of resistance, but what I get from this, from looking at Ignatius Sancho's story and Felix Wheatley's story are, you know, two people who existed in Georgian Red who are incredibly proud of who they were. And I, you know, I think that was amazing. And then, um, you know, the final black children I'm going to refer to, there were plenty, is um, somebody known as Mary Prince. Unfortunately, we do not have a photograph of Mary Prince, but she was very, very important in the abolition of the, of the slave trade once again. Um, and a lot of these black Georgians were, you know, they existed during this time. And, you know, she wrote a book um, on, on slavery and it became a bestseller and it played an important role in the, in the campaign to abolish slavery because what she was able to show us or what she was able to show the people of Britain at that time was that it was a horrible, barbaric, wicked institution that needed to come to an end. And the enslaved Africans were as much human as anyone else. So we just looked at you know, three, rather, three or four rather significant people from the Georgian period. And as I said, um, that period of history is quite, you know, quite often characterized in the, black, in the backdrop of the transatlantic slave trade. We're moving on to the Victorian period where you definitely have remnants of the slave trade and there is an influence there. But we can also start to see how Africans contributed in culture, um, in the military, um, and through various other means. And let me just go through some of these stories and share them with you because I think they're amazing. So first one, this is, this is my favorite, and that's why I put it first. Yeah, Bill Richmond. Um, and Bill Richmond came to Britain as a servant when he was 14 year old, okay? Now, Richmond trained as a boxer and he established a solid career for himself. He, he married an English woman and he had several children. And for me, what I find interesting about Richmond's story, and you know, you can talk to me about this is, um, you know, it looks at race and how far has sport allowed black people to be accepted in Britain, um, if you look, if you've read a Carlos book, Native, he has a really, really cool chapter where he looks at Linford Christie, you know, the lunchbox scandal. He also looks at um, Frank Bruno, the famous boxer. And, you know, Frank Bruno is is the darling of of of, of, of Great Britain. And I don't know, I, I for one, I think the question we had there, you know, 
um, there's often quite a lot said about you know migration and whatnot, but you know you look at more far and more far as heralded, and has sport allowed that? And at the bottom you have myself. So for those who don't know, oh, I I um I used to be an amateur boxer. I did amateur boxing. I had to stop because um, my fiance said it wasn't good. But that's why I really really love the story of Bill Richmond because I love boxing and I'm I just there's such a there's such a spirit that a boxer has that allows them to adapt, allows them to make something of themselves, um, allows an amazing amount of discipline. So yeah, with the, with the Bill Richmond story, you have somebody who was able to achieve something in his life in Britain, and I don't know where the sport allowed him to be accepted as a black man. And you have myself there, um, having won um, <laughs> one of my, my boxing belts, which is quite funny. And you've got my brother and all my, all, all my you know, people I really, really love. All right, now, we've spoken about sports and with Bill Richmond, you've got how black people have contributed to the sports of England at the time. Um, with Ira Aldridge, you have a male who was an African-American, but he was a, a famous Shakespearean actor. And I guess the question we need to ask ourselves is, okay, so why were so many African-Americans in Britain at the time? And um, why did it lead to them becoming um, British? Now, this explanation might not necessarily apply to Ira Al, but it does apply to some of the other African Americans you had in Britain at the time. So um, during America's war for independence, um, America was part of the United Kingdom, and they wanted to break away from the United Kingdom amongst, you know, for a number of reasons. But one of the key reasons was um, the fact that they were being taxed by the British Parliament, but they weren't represented. Represented. Cut the long story short. During the war, what Britain promised, Britain promised any African-American who joined them against, um, you know, the Confederates, they promised them freedom. Um, so what happened, you had a number of African-Americans who went and fought for the British. You had some fought for America as well. Now, as we all know, America won and America became independent. But Britain decided to, you know, honour their their agreement and they brought a number of african americans over to the united kingdom um, and granted them citizenship a lot of the african americans lived in or a lot of the british should i say at that time lived in a quite destitute and in extreme poverty but it explains why so many african americans came here anyway back to era aldrich so he came to britain at the age of 18 in 1825 and he toured throughout the country and married a woman from yorkshire um, he experienced prejudice from london's press but he managed to establish himself on stage and receive various awards. And what we're seeing once again is somebody who made a life for themselves at a time where not only was Britain racist, it was incredibly hostile. And, you know, only God knows the kind of fortitude and, and internal strength people like Bill Richmond and Ira Aldridge had. Okay. Sarah Falls Benetta. This story is really, really cool. So on this photograph, you've got James Davis and you've got Sarah Falls Benetta. Um, now, Sarah Falls Benetta, she was captured in war as an infant and she was presented to a British naval officer, um, you know, by the King of Giza of Dahomey as a gift to Queen Victoria. Cut the long story short, Sarah Falls Benetta pretty much became the goddaughter to Queen Victoria. Yes, the Queen Victoria. But... She was also a bit of a social experiment at the time, you know, she was, she was quite exoticizing that you know, she was clearly raised with quite a lot of privilege and, and whatnot, but I think it was kind of a social experiment of the British at the time to kind of say, you know, if, if we instill these quote unquote Africans with civilization and whatnot, you know, basically it, it kind of supported their argument of colonizing the world. But I don't want to focus on that because we definitely get an understanding of the attitudes in Britain at that time and how they tried to justify taking over our countries. But what's quite interesting is Sarah Ford Benetta's story in this, you know, somebody who was an infant from war, sold into slavery, became the, the goddaughter of Queen Victoria, you know, had to present herself in a, in a certain way. Um, I, I, I would have had so many challenges. You know, you, you, you look at stories where P 
people have been raised in, you know, areas with, you know, predominantly, predominantly white area where they go to middle class schools or they go to universities such as Oxford, as what Hirsch mentions it. And you know, the challenge is there, the challenge is in there. And I, I, I find her story interesting because she's someone who had to grow up in those challenges that a lot of us would have faced. But she also managed to do quite well for herself. And then you've got um, Samuel Coldridge Taylor. Um, so Samuel Coldridge Taylor, he was born in London in 1875, and his father was English, and his mother was from Sierra Leone. Now, he became one of the most famous classical composers of his day, best known for the choral court and work, Hewatha's Wedding Feast, written in 1898. Now, Taylor was proud of his African heritage, and he often used um, African melodies in his compositions, in his different songs, and in, in, in some ways, um, we've got to thank the people like Ignatius Sancho because, you know, he was able, one thing I, I didn't stress when I was talking about Ignatius Sancho, and this is what was important, I think Samuel Coleridge Taylor was very similar. They went out of their way to show that black people in this time were as good as anyone. But, um, and they did this through being educated, through um, their literary, through their, through their arts. They showed that they were just as well, or, or equal to any human being. But what is always interesting when you look at the stories of Samuel Coleridge Taylor, or you look at the story of Ignatius Sancho, it's the fact that they never lost sight of their African roots. They always had that deep sense of pride, which I thought was, you know, which I think is quite cool. And um, if you, literally, I'm in South Norwood now, just down the road from South Norwood, you have the Samuel Coleridge Taylor Center. Um, and this is interesting, I, you know, I was talking to one of the people who helped me with the PowerPoints and stuff, and they had no idea um, who Samuel Coldridge Taylor was. Um, but what I liked about Samuel Coldridge Taylor anyway was that he was concerned with the problems facing black people all over the world. And he helped to organize the first Pan-African Conference in 1900. So for those people who may not understand what the term Pan-African means, it's really not allowing you know, divisions to be seen. It's seeing everyone from the African continent as being white. Um, and this is quite a hot topic of debate when you get Nigerians and Ghanaians in the same place. I'm Nigerian and Nigerians tend to be incredibly um, loud. But what I always say to people is, look, I'm Pan-African. I'm, I'm, I'm bigger than that. I love, I love all people from the African continent. And it's quite interesting because back in 1912, you had somebody, or 1900, sorry, you had somebody who was very similar. Now, tragically, Coldridge died in 1912 at the age of 37. And... Who knows what he could have gone to achieve, but he played a massive part in society by recognizing the plights of Africans, but also excelling to the very top of Victorian England and showing that Africans were just as capable as anyone else in the scene. Okay, so Jackie Griffiths says, I keep on talking about African Americans. The reason why I keep on talking about African Americans, I think definitely at the start was, they were British, you're right, because America was part of the British Empire. But I use the term African Americans in that context to let us understand that these Africans who became British citizens came from the Americas. And that's why um, I use the term. And African American is a term that they often refer to themselves as as well. Okay, military. So how have um, black British people or contributed to, to us in terms of military? So we had um, black, and black Africans in the infantry and you also have them in the Navy. Um, Aludu, Aludu Equiano actually served in the Navy at that time. Now quite often, you don't really hear about the stories of individual seamen or, or soldiers who are part of the regiment, but black people served in the British Army forces for a very long time. And for, for years, army regiments had employed African and Caribbean musicians as military Navy bandsmen. So, you know, they play the drums and play the various um, instruments. But you also had them, who, you also had Africans who served in the Royal Navy. Now, to the bottom, that's a, it's a picture I find really interesting. Now, if you go to Trafalgar Square, you'll see it's, it's, Nelson, it's Nelson's column. But if you look to the bottom, you have an African involved in, um, involved in this picture and it's, it's 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 showing us a battle that took point took place sorry and i think 
is very, very important because we are able to see how black people were there at very, very significant moments. But more so, one of the stories I actually find interesting was this was at a time where Britain were going to war with France, they're going to war with Napoleon. And what's very interesting about it was this plaque was actually taken from a French cannon. So the British took the French cannons, they, they melted them down and they made this sculpture. And it, it was kind of, you know, pretty much written with this in France. You know, we've, we've beaten you and we've taken your weapons and we've used it to celebrate ourselves. And that's something I found interesting. And as Britain's empire and trade grew, African and Caribbean men were recruited for both the Royal and Merchant Navies. I'll come to those questions shortly. Now, another group who managed to do pretty well in Britain at the time were the Somalis. Um, they were East African, and they managed to set in ports in Liverpool, Cardiff, Hull, East London, South Shields in time, and they built their own communities there. And I think this is quite interesting because there's been a rise, should I say, in Islamophobia. And through the Somalis, you, you're able to see how people were able to still come hold on to their beliefs, hold on to their religion, but still integrate and become a part of British society. Politics. So I've, I've mentioned how, you know, black people have contributed to Britain in terms of, you know, socially and culturally. We've looked at the military. Um, we also look at politics as well. Now, most black people were poor and lived amongst the working people in towns and countryside. But the majority of people who lived in England at that time were poor. Um, and the majority of people who worked in Britain worked in terrible conditions, they worked incredibly long hours, and they were poorly paid. Um, you know, that was the, should I say, the consequences of the Industrial Revolution. And one of the issues you had was it was difficult and often illegal for poor people to form unions to fight for their rights. And the whole idea of rights and the rule of law, that's something that we we pride ourselves on in Britain and it played a key part in developing the nation. Now, you have somebody known as William Davidson. Now, Davidson was born in Jamaica in 1786 and he came to Britain when he was 14. Now, he joined a group of revolutionaries after the Peterloo Massacre. And we need to understand what was going on at this time. At this time, you had something known as the French Revolution, where pretty much, you know, the people in France killed their king. And in Britain at the time, they were very, very worried about revolutions or people trying to, you know, kill um, people in government. So if people of, you know, a number, a significant number of people came together, they would often put them down. And the police force hadn't been made until the 1820s. So it's often um, the military who were involved in the Peterloo Massacre was an incredibly, incredibly um, significant moment in British history. Um, now, William Davidson, he was part of a of the Cattle Street conspiracy, which planned to assassinate the Prime Minister, Lord Liverpool. The group fell and they were executed. But in this story, you can already start to see the contribution of black people in fighting for um, rights, workers' rights. And the story progresses a bit more. So we have William um, Cuffey here. So William, was, William Cuffey was born in Kent in 1788 and he worked as a tailor. Um, and like many other workers, he joined the Chartist movement in the 1830s who demanded revolt and other rights for working men. Now, the Chartists were a very, very important group in British history. Um, they didn't manage to achieve all of their aims whilst they were alive, but from the turn of the century in the 1900s, um, you know, the, the right for men to vote, um, you know, the whole getting rid of the idea of only rich people could become MPs. They really, really fought against that and kind of established the political climate or played a role in this in establishing the political climate we have today. Now, Coffey became one of the leaders of the London Chartist movement and he was known throughout Britain. So here you have an, an important individual who was not only a part of the Chartist movement, he also um, became the leader. And I thought that's quite cool because that's not really um, something I was taught. And William Coffey was by no means the only black man who played an active part in the London Chartist movement. You also had somebody called David Anthony Duffy and Benjamin Prophet. And these are also two members who both took part in the Camden World demonstrations on the 13th of March, 1848. And finally, you have Mary Seacole. So now, Mary Seacole is probably the most famous black 
great British woman from the 19th century. And she was born in 1805 and she grew up in Jamaica. She traveled at her own expense through the battlefields during the Crimean War and she nursed the sick and wounded the troops. Now, Mary Seacole was awarded four medals for her work, but some might argue that she is not regarded as to be as important as Florence Nightingale, when essentially they, they pretty much did very, very similar jobs. Now, um, in, 1580, in 1856, sorry, Mary Siegel returned to live in Britain, and in 1857, she published her autobiography, The Wonderful Adventures of Mary Siegel in Many Lands. Now, the story of Mary Siegel is quite important because at this time, you know, the idea of cleanliness and keeping people clean, that was quite a, a new breakthrough in medicine. And one of the reasons why Florence Nightingale is seen as such a significant contributor to the development of medicine through time was her understanding of cleanliness, of having to keep the wounds of soldiers clean. And Mary Seacole did, you know, did the exact same thing. And um, I'm, I'm happy that she's going there. They're considering placing her on a British note. Um, but yeah, she's somebody who you know, was able to contribute to Britain in terms of the development of medicine. And finally, okay, we, have, we have John Archer. Now, John Archer became the first black mayor um, of Battersea in South London in 1913. Um, he was born in Liverpool. His father was from Barbados and his mother was Irish. And he managed to achieve his face, of his fate, sorry, in the face of hostile racism. Now, what you actually have from a number of these, these stories is people who've contributed to Britain in various different ways. You've got people who were there at you know, the Battle of Trafalgar, which was a very, very important military event in Britain. You have people who were there who have contributed towards the development of medicine. And you've got composers. And what you have, you start to have a bit more of a positive story of people who, who played a massive role in, in how Britain developed. And, you know, I know the session over the past couple, or the previous session was quite difficult when, when we had to deal and grapple with the transatlantic slave trade and the legacy of the transatlantic slave trade. But now we're also starting to see how people contributed to Britain and how Britain, the Britain we have today was built with the contribution of black British people. And that is one of the reasons why I would argue that black British history is British history. And it's not only the story of the transatlantic slave trade that we push, we also push the other con the positive contributions. Now I'm going to play the, um, I'm going to play the song shortly, but I'm just going to quickly engage with some of the questions here to see if um, I can answer this. Um, I heard also that no woman has got a diplomatic time as you can argue that men could be doctors and shit. Maybe I um, thank you, Hannah Crane. I, I didn't actually know that, but um, Nightingale was from an incredibly um, posh family. Yeah, so, and I'm American. Yeah, so that's why I, that's why I refer to them as African American, but the whole African American is difficult because really back then the United States was part of Britain, but I just, you know, make that point to differentiate the two. Um, okay, so I think, I think Jackie Griffiths is happy with me now, which is all good. All right, so what I'm gonna do first is I'm going to play um, the, the song, should I say? Let me just make sure the song is ready to be played so that we can listen to it. Okay, so one moment, I'm just going to so we can listen to the composition by Ignatius Sancho. Shall we share? Okay. Try to get the sound right before I play it. Okay, cool. So we got that. Okay, and listen to the composition that was made by um, Ignatius Sancho. 
So I'm going to come into the group now and just see, find out whether we've been able to hear that. And yeah, so we've got about, you know, 10, 15 minutes and we usually have a guess amount of time, but I guess this is an opportunity um, for you guys to ask um, me some more questions. I might not know the answer to all of them, but you know, if, if I, um, if I do, um, I'll try my best to answer. So yeah, so any, any questions and yeah, brilliant, um, Joanna, I, I haven't heard the song until, um, or the composition until I researched it. Um, so yeah, that was that was quite interesting. Any any questions? Okay, so let me go to top. So Karen, um, you missed sessions three and four. Can you get a recording? Um, I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure you can. I think um, once we finish the series, we'll be able to send those recordings out. So it should be good. Thanks, Nick, for telling people. I mean, I mean, thanks, Jackie, for telling people to mute the mic. Thanks for that. Yes, Naomi. Um, yes, uh, Jordan might have originated from a really, really cool person. All right, so let's go. Um, would you say that in Georgian Victorian times, it was a game class that is important? Yeah, definitely. Because um, even, especially for Victorian England, more so than Georgian. England, I would say Britain, sorry, I would say that class really, really started to emerge. I think because this was the time that you had, you know, the growth of factories, you know, people moving from the countryside to the cities, you had the growth of factories and, you know, class was very, very, very important. And it was really clear, I think today is quite, class is a bit more insidious, you know, it's, it, it's a bit more difficult to kind of put your finger on. But back then, it was quite clear if you're working class, it was quite clear if you're middle class, it was quite clear if you're from the aristocracy, and you know, one of the key things, if you're from the aristocracy, you didn't work, you owned land and people worked on, people would work on that land for you. Um, yeah, so class was really, really, um, was really, really important. Um, and I think class and race, to be honest, I think they're two sides of the same coin. I don't think you could truly understand class if you understand race. And I don't think you could truly understand race if you don't understand class. That's just my opinion. And, Helen, I'll, I'll, you know, continue um, talking about that if you want. What surprised you the most when you were researching this period? Uh, I think, to be honest, like I've, I've found, I, I studied or looked a bit, I looked at this period quite a while ago. But um, I think what actually, what actually um, surprised me was how proud some of these people were of their culture and their identity, you know, the way Ignatius Sancho um, was quite clear in, you know, claiming his African heritage and how, how he went out to show that black people were equal to every human being. That, that surprised me. I, I didn't know that they would have had such a, such a huge amount of pride in, in their identity back then. Did I say that she was given, did I say that Sarah Ford Benetta was given a gift? Was that common? Well, I think considering that she was raised in the aristocracy, so what I mean by aristocracy, the, the royal um, people in the country at that time, I've, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. So I, I, I can't give you 
an answer. But what I will say, it wasn't common for Queen Victoria to adopt people and, you know, make them a part of her extended family. That wasn't common. Thanks, Carol. I'm, I'm, I'm happy you've enjoyed the stories. Did all, I, I, don't, I don't know if all black people gained their independence, but um, some of them certainly, certainly did. And, I, and really and truly, it's the English giving you know, black people their independence, let me not fool you and present it like it was you know, the, the British being kind and being you know, benevolent, originally what they were kind of trying to undermine the Americans and um, they were trying to destabilize them, you know, in terms of them honoring it later. Um, David Oshuba, uh, David Oshuba speaks about why they honored it. And I don't, I don't really know why they honored it, if I'm, if I'm being honest with you. Um, but certainly they were, if the, the people who survived who were able to get a certain parts, they, they were able to, gain their freedom. But you also had, and I'm using the word African Americans because I'm talking about the enslaved Africans who were in America at the time, just for point of clarification. And you know, you had African Americans who didn't trust them as well. They said, you know, why would you suddenly want to grant me um, independence or freedom? You know, you had people who questioned that. Thanks, Emma. I'm happy you're enjoying them. Good. So what Carol, Carol's making a really interesting point. So what you had, the key thing about Britain and America at that time is you didn't have plantations in England. The plantations were in the Americas. The plantations were in the Caribbean. And not only did you not have plantations, and plantations, you know, plantations were the Americans were to produce sugar, to produce cotton, to produce tobacco. Those are in the Americas. But not only did you have, um, not only did you have the plantations in America, in the Americas, and I'm using the Americas to talk about, you know, North America and the Caribbean. But the laws there are different. You know, you had, you had the slave codes there. And this is where British history is quite funny because the law on slavery in the UK was quite questionable. And there was a, you know, famous case, Lord Mansfield, Granville Sharp, you know, cut the long story short, an enslaved African, Jonathan Sean, was beaten up. He was thrown away by his master. His master wanted to enslave him. Um, and there was a Mansfield case on this. And there wasn't a conclusive judgment. So the law in England wasn't conclusive. You did have slaves in Britain at the time, but quite often that occurred because the plantation owners came to Britain on holiday and they came to Britain on holiday. They brought their slaves who quite often ran away and escaped. But also were caught and you know were quite severely punished sometimes. Were there any black <laughs> I doubt it. I I I I you know I, I, I know I mentioned Francis Barber. Um I, I, I think even to write that problem I don't think you'd have had you'd have had many so I'm not I don't think so. I'm not sure. So you say, referring back to last week when you said that said the construction of a race was due to slave trade, cool. Um, whereas prior to it, it was class. I don't know if I get that was important. If I said, I don't know if I said it's class. I think religion. I think in the Tudors, religion was probably one of the biggest indicators of um, of identity. And you, you did have class, but not not in the same way. But okay, if class was more important in Victorian times as in Tudor times, what has left, what has led to the current construction of race? I, I, I don't quite get your question, Helen. If you could rephrase it again, I, I don't quite get it. Do you know if there are black areas or white areas? And do you know what they are? I don't, I would, I, okay, how, how much time have I got left? Um, so in in the 1800s, I, I, I doubt you know what you what you'd have had. You would have had working class areas and wealthy areas, and you'd have found the black people in those working class areas. And quite often, places like London, um, you'd often find black people near to cities that had ports.
Now my dissent was on the contribution of Africa in the Caribbean coast. Thanks. Thank you. Um, agreed. Okay, so I've got about got about five minutes. So let me let me try my best to answer this question. And so it says, referring back to last week when you said. Oh, okay. So what's led to the current construction of race? Well, oh, I don't, I don't really think race, I don't really think race has ever really been dealt with, but what you will find, and if, I'm going to try to answer your question, Ken, if I'm not, if I'm not answering correctly, I don't mean to um, come in here. Um, you've got a very, very interesting situation with the United States, and you have a very, very situ interesting situation in Britain. And the whole, the whole concept of race is like, it's, it's, such a, it's such a funny construct. And the reason why I say that is, in the 90s, so like I said, the, the Americans, they re refer to them as African-Americans, but I think it was in the 1950s, 1960s, when you had the Black Power Movement in, um, in the United Kingdom, the term Black was actually a political one. And in that period, it, it was used to not only talk to Caribbean and Africans, but Indians, um, Arabs, anybody who was from the British Empire who experienced racism, who experienced oppression at the time in Britain, they classed as black and they tried to bring them together to fight against um, the empire imperialism. So that's, black has a very interesting political term in Britain. And quite often, if you were, if you were confronted with someone who was a bigger, they didn't, you know, um, distinguish the difference between an Indian or, or a black person. They would often refer to both of them as the N word. And when Britain came up with immigration laws, they didn't, once again, didn't differentiate between um, black people, South East Asian people, Chinese people, Arab people. Those laws only try to prevent immigration from these regions. And that's why at that time, um, you know, all people who were part of the empire could have, could have associated themselves with being black. The current racism that we experience today was a construct devised by a man who was on a plantation and he hated it. His ideas were taken up by society in Britain who wished to be compensated from slavery, were turned down and then finally agreed to ensure interesting Carol, who was, you know, you might know more than me, who was the man? I'm not entirely sure who the man was. Um, okay, and thank you. So I think our time, oh, we've got two minutes more. Any quick, quick questions before, before we go? Thanks, 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 Hannah. Um, thank you for joining each week. I, I appreciate it. Thanks, Janie. Thanks, Isma. Thank you, EOG. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy you guys are getting something from it. Thank you, Carol. Thanks. I, thank you. All right. So I think. All right. Okay. So, Carol, um, what you can do is you've got my social media somewhere. So, at Josh Prayer Gary. Um, yeah, just. Get, get in contact with me on Twitter and, you know, we, we can have a chat about it. I'm sure there may be things that you can enlighten me on. Um, but yeah, so um, further reading, staying power as always, um, Black, British, A Forgotten History, um, Professor Haki Mabi's African and Caribbean Communities in Britain. Um, and yeah, and next week we're going to be looking at, um, we're going to be still focusing on the contribution of Black Britons, but we're going to be looking at contributions during the First World War, Second World War, and leading up to 1945, where we'll stop and we'll finally talk about the Americans. All right, so thank you once again for, um, for joining, and I, I hope to see you all next week. Oh, let me, and um, for the person who wants to contact me, sorry, let me just quickly put my Twitter handle there so you can, yeah, so you can quickly get that and then we can, we can we can chat so twitter or instagram i prefer twitter but yeah we could do we could do all of them okay um thank you for your time and i hope to see you all 
Um, next week. Bye.